To present the chairman's report, please welcome ULI Global Chairman and CEO and President, UDR Inc., Tom Toomey. Well, thank you for that warm welcome. You know, every host city is special to ULI. But in Boston in particular, is particularly special in the ULI history. The first real estate education conference, a precursor to the fall meeting, was held in Boston in 1941. It was the start of ULI's long history of leadership in this great city. The last time we held a fall meeting in Boston was in 2001, less than a month after 9-11. Due to the leadership of ULI Boston, that meeting turned out especially meaningful in terms of being together and sharing ideas on the future of cities. The same desire for fellowship and to share knowledge is very much evident at this meeting this week. Let me express for all of ULI a special thank you to the ULI Boston team for hosting us again. <laughs> Rather than give you a full-scale State of the Union and a lot of facts and reading on and on, let me just assure you that we've had a very productive, a very busy 12 months since we last met in Los Angeles. Each of our major meetings, the fall and spring meetings in the United States, the Asia Pacific Summit, the European Conference, were highly successful. Each of them broke records in terms of attendance and sponsorship. Our membership expanded to 15 more countries, bringing total to over 80 countries across the globe. Our membership, 42,000 globally, a level not seen before the recession. We've created a new global strategic plan based on member input, your input, that includes investments in people, investments in technology infrastructure, to strengthen the members' engagement and impact. Our new global CEO, Ed Walter, is a strong leader who will guide implementation of the plan and keep ULI moving forward. You will hear from Ed later this week. So yes, as global chairman, it is gratifying to tell you we've had a great, great year, but one year is just one piece of the 80-year history of changing people and lives, people's lives and communities. Everything this organization has ever accomplished and will accomplish in the future is because of its members, you. Members like each of you are dedicated to improving our cities throughout the world with your philanthropic spirit specifically given your time, your talent, and your treasure to ULI. Our work to shape cities is far-reaching and long-lasting. And the better we are at demonstrating the impact of our work, your work, the more success we will have at inspiring members to give more so that ULI can, in fact, do more. And capturing and communicating the impact is exactly the type of initiatives that our new strategic plan will support. ULI's impact is best demonstrated by outcomes we've influenced in cities nationally and across the globe. For instance, here in Boston, the revitalization of many places Kendall Square, Roxbury, Lowell, South Bay reflect recommendations made by ULI advisory panels over the past several decades. 
across the country in Los Angeles, the city has embraced ULI's plans for transformational housing to shelter the homeless. That work has sparked rec by recommendations from a ULI panel in LA just last December. And just around the globe, in Asia, a panel helped Wuhan, China, with advice on how to become an international model of a smart city. Another helped Hong Kong rethink its long-term development plans. And most recently, a panel in Wurzburg, Germany, advised the city on becoming more resilient. ULI's mission and our drive to make our cities better for all remain strong. Through the execution of the strategic plan, we will continue to expand advisory services and other mission-focused activities even more. And we will grow our ability to measure ULI's impact. A longtime tradition of ULI is measuring impact by best practices, is through recognition, through our awards programs. One of these is our Urban Open Space Award, which highlights projects that have catalyzed economic development while serving a community amenity. I'm very pleased to announce that we have two winners of our 2018 Urban Open Space Award. Levi Park. <laughs> Madrid Real Park in Madrid. And this year, we also have a special community impact category. This recognition goes to Ricardo Laurel Park in Linwood, California. <laughs> These distinctive parks are all part of a selective group of places that make cities more interesting and certainly more appealing. Could our winners please stand? Congratulations, you're very special and we appreciate it very much. Moving on, our housing awards are another example of member impact. These awards are given each year by ULI Twilliger Center for Housing, named after its founder, Ron Twilliger. Ron has always been a passionate about affordable housing. And fortunately for ULI, he has made the Institute one of his key philanthropic choices. Ron saw in ULI a way to advance his commitment to raise awareness of affordable housing shortages affecting so many of our cities. Each year, the Terwilliger Center showcases affordable and workforce housing development that addresses these shortages. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome Ron to the stage. He'll be sharing some exciting news about the latest winners of the Jack Kemp Excellence in Affordable Workforce Housing and the Robert C. Housing Policy Leadership Award. Welcome, Ron, and thank you for your commitment to your lot. Thank you, thank you, thank you sir. Thank you, Tom. I've been a ULI member for more than 40 years. I found that the more I became involved in ULI leadership, the more I began to focus on ULI's mission. I became enthusiastic about what I believe ULI can do to improve neighborhoods and community life. Consequently, I founded the Terwilliger Center for Housing more than a decade ago to give ULI a stronger voice on housing, to raise awareness of the role that affordable, decent, well-located housing plays in creating vibrant communities with upwardly mobile families. 
Initially, the Terwilliger Center work focused exclusively on workforce housing, housing for people who don't qualify for low-income housing subsidies, but make too little to afford market rate housing. We put a face on workforce housing. Teachers, nurses, police officers, and firemen who could not afford to live anywhere near where they worked. Although the center's focus has broadened, workforce housing is still a top priority, and the shortage of workforce housing is getting worse. As more cities become successful, they become less affordable, and more people are pushed out to the edges. Ten years ago, we established the Jack Kemp Excellence in Affordable and Workforce Housing Award and the Robert C. Larson Housing Policy Leadership Award to recognize and honor those who are trying to tackle this problem. Both awards honor the memory of two great friends of ULI and two champions of housing who sat on our initial advisory board. Each year when we go through the award applications, I'm always struck by the complexity involved in seeing these workforce projects develop and getting these legislative policies in place. Providing quality affordable housing is not getting any easier. That's why I'm so proud that over the years we've celebrated nearly 60 winning projects and policies made possible by you housers out there. The Kemp winners are opening up our communities to more people by developing mixed income communities and the Larson winners are encouraging mixed income communities with policies to incentivize such developments. Now let's go to the 2018 winners. This year we picked five recipients for the Kemp Award. They are Avenue Place Avenue Terrace, which has created a true community for families in a low income but gentrifying area of Houston. Clybourne 1200, an impressive revitalization of the former Cabrini Green public housing development in Chicago. Tiaho Lane, a modern transit-oriented workforce housing development in a high-cost neighborhood of Honolulu. Conway Center, an impressive housing development for the very low income and formerly homeless of Washington, D.C., paired with services and amenities, including an on-site health clinic. And not far from where we are today, Harbor Place Residence, a mixed income housing development that was reopened and revitalized the waterfront of downtown Haverhill, Massachusetts. All are outstanding examples of affordable and workforce housing. And I'm very proud to announce two recipients of the Larson Award, the New York State Mortgage Finance Agency and the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transit Authority. New York State's Community Restoration Fund buys or modifies delinquent mortgages to provide relief to struggling homeowners, still reeling from the financial crisis. This program is truly innovative and groundbreaking public-private partnership that has successfully demonstrated how thoughtful interventions can expedite community renewal, bringing stability back to the housing market. LA Metro's affordable housing policies demonstrate the impact a non-housing agency can have by leveraging the land held by LA Metro. Their programs include a fund that preserves and expands affordable housing at or near transit stations by codifying affordable housing into the Federal Transit Administration's community benefits category, allowing other municipalities to adopt similar policies. I also want to call attention to a special award we're bestowing this year for a truly innovative workforce housing project that did not meet the mixed income criteria of the Kemp Award, but still deserves recognition. Our Chairman Award goes to the Aspen Skiing Company's Workforce Housing in Aspen, Colorado, which repurposed a 40-year-old RV campground located on a major transit corridor into a 120-bed workforce housing community of small, high-quality, factory-built trailer coaches. The project is a response to an acute affordable housing shortage that threatens the viability of this small, rural resort community. This highlights a particularly innovative solution to the affordable housing crisis faced by employers in high-end resort communities. 
If our winners would now stand, I'd like to invite you all to please join me in congratulating them. Thank you and congratulations. Each of these projects and policies demonstrates the commitment and leadership that is necessary to make affordable workforce housing accessible to those who so desperately need it. They are an inspiration that I hope will lead to more solutions for more of our communities. Thank you and enjoy the meeting. To introduce our afternoon speakers, please welcome Brian Koop, Executive Vice President, Boston Region, Boston Properties. Welcome ULI to Boston. You couldn't be here at a better time. Of course, we always have historic things for you to tour, but we have also a historic development pace in the city of Boston, as you can see by the cranes and the record amount of growth we have. But we also came through on the weather for you, and then of course our citizens are in a great mood after that Red Sox win to last night. Sorry to our uh, New York associates. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this afternoon's general session. Boston uh, Mayor Marty, Martin Walsh and Secretary of Housing and Economic Development Jay Walsh from the Commonwealth of uh, Massachusetts. J Jay Ash, I'm sorry. Um, Mayor Walsh is a lifelong champion of the working people and a proud product of our city of Boston. He's our 54th uh, mayor and he's on his second term with incredibly high popularity ratings right now. Mayor Walsh's vision for our city is that of a thriving, healthy, and innovative Boston, a city with equal opportunity for all, where we take our history of revolutionary ideas and turn them into new and creative solutions for the future. And I might add, he's a heck of a recruiter for the city of Boston, landing a record amount of new companies coming to our city, but at the same time providing them with leadership about what our expectations are for them to be great citizen in giving back. Secretary Ash is responsible for directing and executing Governor Charlie Baker's agenda on housing and community development, job creation, business development, consumer affairs, and then also our business regulations. Since joining the administration in 2015, Secretary Ash has prioritized efforts for job growth, um, helping our communities to understand their economic opportunity throughout the Commonwealth and spreading prosperity to all corners of the state of Massachusetts. This afternoon, we'll hear first from Mayor Walsh, and then we're gonna follow in an engaging discussion about this unique partnership the mayor and the uh, governor have and the keys to success in our economic development and also really why this partnership is so unique. So please welcome to the stage our mayor, Marty Walsh. Thank you very much, Brian. And um, I want to thank Brian for his great work in the city. And I was backstage listening when he talked about the Red Sox. There wasn't much of a crutch, uh, chair in this room. So in case you don't realize, who's, any New Yorkers in this room? All right. I was in New York last night. I was coming home as a kid at the, at the machine. I said, what's the score on the game? He goes, Boston's one in three, nothing. So he was all upset. But good luck tonight. Not too much luck. Anybody from Houston in this room? Yeah. All right. We'll see you next week. But anyway, thank you very much. Um, no, I, I want to I wanna thank, uh, I wanna, first of all, I want to thank uh, everyone for being here today. I'm grateful that you're holding this conversation in Boston. Uh, I want to thank the Urban Land Institute. In particular, I want to give Ed Walter and Tom Toomey a thank you for being here in the city. Uh, and in a few minutes, uh, myself and, and um, Jay Ash, we're going to have a, a nice chat about our city and where we're going in our Commonwealth. But this is an important organization and an important, important conference. And again, thank you for having it here in Boston. Land you, you shapes every single thing that cities uh, and everything else, who are cities, and helps everything that we do in cities. Our homes, our jobs, our public spaces, our mobility, our environment, and our future. That means the real estate development is the heart of the relationship between the public and the private sector. Boston has done pretty well in this area. Uh, we are growing as a city and we're thriving. 
Our population is approaching 700,000 people for the first time since the 1960s. It's growing close to roughly 10,000 people per year since I've been the mayor and I got, I got sworn in in 2014. We continue to add, we've added 20,000 new jobs every year in the city of Boston in that time. Our unemployment rate is, has been below 4% since 2017. We launched a housing plan four years ago um, to produce 53,000 units of new housing by the year 2030. We have 28,000 new homes either built or under construction right now. We have another 25,000 in the planning process and we reworked our housing plan to raise the number from 53,000 units of new housing uh, by 2030 to 69,000 units of new housing. By the end of the year, we'll have created more income-restricted affordable homes than any other four-year any other four-year period uh, on record here in the city of Boston. The majority of these affordable homes are created in partnerships with the real estate industry through our inclusionary development policy, working with them to raise the number. In all, $9.3 billion of construction is happening right now in Boston. And so as you came to the convention center today and you see the, the cranes right out here on the South Boston waterfront, we had them all over the city of Boston. This year, we've already approved over $6.4 billion of new development in our pipeline, and we're well ahead of last year's pay. So we look, we're looking to surpass that as far as keeping this development pipeline moving here in the city of Boston. This investment creates homes and jobs. It also is a main source of revenue growth for the city. We're able to invest even more than we ever have been in our schools, in our libraries, our parks, our police, our fire stations, our EMS, job training, homeless services, and so much more. But our relationship with the real estate community is a, financial, is, is a very important one, and it's more than financial. It's a partnership in advancing our city's values. Recently, we just completed our first regional city master plan in over 50 years in the city of Boston. It's called Imagine Boston 2030. We talked to over 15,000 residents of our city, businesses and nonprofits. Together we designed a roadmap on how to physically grow our city, showing we can add more housing, jobs and open space. It also makes it clear what kind of city that we want to be as we continue to grow because one of the, the knocks on cities is that we don't plan. We don't plan the infrastructure, we don't plan the schools, we don't plan the libraries, we don't plan the open space and this truly is one of those opportunities where we did all of that. We want to hold on to our diversity in our city, and we want to continue to welcome immigrants in our city. Our city is 53% people of color, 51% women, and 28% of the people that live in our city were born in another country. So we want to make sure that we're a city where opportunity is for everyone, no matter what your starting point is coming to, coming to Boston. No one should be pushed out, and certainly we feel no one should be left out. We want to continue to make sure that we're a city that's world class because it works for the middle class. Every project that we have in Boston is unique, but every project should advance us one way or another towards, our, towards the goals that we've laid out in our plan. I want to share one example about that process. If you follow the real estate in Boston, many of you are certainly familiar with it. The Winter Square Garage, which is in the heart of downtown Boston, was a broken down city property that was condemned since 1997. It was producing no revenue. It wasn't parking any cars. We had, to, we had to close it down because of safety reasons. It was used at one point for 1,100 parking spaces uh, that were used for cars. Now it's used for rats running around there, literally rats running in the, in the facility. So we put out a request for proposal. At any point in the process, if you read the papers, you might think it wasn't going well. There were questions about the value of the property. There were questions about the shadows that it was going to cast on Boston Common. All of those issues were resolved and the shadow impact on Boston Common was minimal. There was a process around FAA rules and the height of the tower and how we got, we got that resolved working with the FAA. Two weeks ago, we just closed on an agreement with the Millennium Partners and here's the final outcome. The initial payment to the City of Boston for the land is $102 million, which we expect another $50 million that will come after the condo sell. Our commitment, we decided to take this money and rather than put it in the general fund, do one-time expenditures to look at, look at some of what we need to do in the city of Boston. We're going, to be, we, we're going to be making investments in Boston Common, which is the first public park in the country. We're making a $28 million investment. We're making a $28 million to Franklin Park in the heart of our neighborhoods. We're making a $5 million investment on the Rose Kennedy Greenway. $35 million to renovate, continue the renovation of housing developments in South Boston and East Boston. And this tower is going to have po positive impacts all across our city, even before the first shovel goes in the grounds. And the construction will advance our goals as well. 
It's going to be the lead platinum building, making it a national model for high performance towers in the country. It will create thousands of construction jobs while it's being built and thousands more permanent jobs once it's completed. It will bring public realm improvements downtown, both to outdoor space and new indoor space. And we estimate about $12 million a year in tax revenue that will come into the city of Boston. The inclusionary component of this project is $25 million investment for affordable housing in Chinatown to help us relieve the displacement that's happening in the pressures in that community. This project is special because it was a city-owned property, but the values of this are the same. It's about how do we shape the next era of our city's history. Parking garages make an interesting historic case. They grew, they grew with the rise of cars, and they ended up dominating a lot of different spaces in a lot of urban America. We're entering a new era right now, and we're starting to think differently about how do we handle these garages that we have in Boston. So parking garages in Boston are a major source of conversations and proposals. We have the Government Center Garage near Haymarket, which we're having development there, the Harbor Garage on the waterfront, which has proposed another development, Dark Square Garage near the Greenway, which we're looking at, and also the Motormark Garage, which is in the theater district. We're looking at development in all of those different areas. These are all in different stages of the process and how do we move forward. But the larger point is, are we working together to reimagine urban spaces and transportation infrastructure? We, we don't want in Boston anymore concrete monsters. And if you're from Boston, if you look where I work every day in City Hall, it's a big concrete monster in the city of Boston. Through some eyes, it's an amazing architectural gem. So I just want to throw that out there. So after I leave here today, I don't get yelled at for saying that. But in all seriousness, we're looking for mixed uses in great public space. We're looking for a cr creativity and great design. We're looking to advance our values together. I want to share two new examples of how we're asking your industry to help us advance our goals. First, it's about achieving greater diversity and opportunity in development. This week, we announced new criteria and an RFP for developing public lands. Proposals have showed us that they are planning to achieve diversity on projects, teams working together in contracting, and what they will do to avoid causing displacement to residents. So what we want to do is create wealth in communities of color in the city of Boston, but also give opportunities for people to be part of larger scale deals in the city of Boston. The ideas were developed in the plan called the Plan Dudley Square process, working with the community in Roxbury. They're building on the strengths of our residency jobs policy to make sure that the people that are working on those projects live in the city of Boston and working in the communities they, they, they come out of, working with the Office of Housing Stability and working with our new updated housing plan. We have partners who are doing good jobs on these issues, including some here today, and I want to thank all of you that are helping us move, move the agenda forward and move the ball down the field. These criteria make clear that everyone who wants to work with public land should help advance public goals. Moving forward, we have an issue that is a threat not to only our growth, but to every single city that all of you represent in this room. It's climate change. The UN report out this week warns of major impacts the world does not make the if the world does not make the changes in the next 12 years. Boston is a leader in this work, both in energy efficiency and climate preparedness. But now we have to take this work to a new level. We are looking at the storms of 2050 and 2070 and the flood maps. We are looking what, to what happened in New York City with Superstorm Sandy and in Houston with Hurricane Harvey. We've seen new levels of storm surge here in the city of Boston. And in January, we saw a dumpster not too far from this building floating down the street. We are looking at what we can do along our waterfront to protect our entire city from flooding. But here's one of the challenges. Our 47-mile waterfront touches at least 356 different property owners. There's plenty we can do on the city-owned land, but floods don't care about property lines. This has to be a true partnership. I'm going to be talking about more about this next week at the Chamber of Commerce breakfast, but I can share one important piece with all of you that we're inviting developers and in construction industry to be part of. We are close to releasing climate resilient design standards for work on public right of ways. These are guidelines for designs of flood barriers with a process for evaluating your options. We'll have sample designs for different kinds of sites. The goal will not, will not only protect one building, but will protect spaces around that building. So it's not just about protecting that one property owner, but it's about protecting the community around that area. 
Buildings and streets and sidewalks should work together to protect neighborhoods from flooding, to help us maintain access to emergency responses, and to get back to the normal, get, get back to normal after an event. So in all these ways, public sector and private sector are working even more closely together to grow our city and stay open for business, to protect our city and sustain our values. It's working for Boston and people are taking notice. The World Economic Forum just called Boston the fifth most future-proof city in the world due to our strength in education, technology, and the environment. I want to thank all of you for your role here. I want to thank you for having this very important conversation that you'll be having here in the city of Boston. And I look forward to talking even further in a couple minutes. So thank you. Pretty impressive. Yeah, you're in there. I think you're in the middle. I didn't realize the mic was on. <laughs> well, this is like a throwback set from Jack Parday, huh? Well, thanks for joining us, gentlemen. Um, Jay, um, I was teasing Jay that our, our mutual friend Jay Walsh, who's the Uptown director, um, feels like he got a promotion when I mis mis put his name in for your se uh, secretary. Apparently, when you have a son, it'll look like me. <laughs> <laughs> if you were two more inches tall, you'd be yeah. the VA. <laughs> so, um, Mayor and Jay, you could speak for the governor on this. Um, you've received a lot of attention for this partnership that you've put together and how effectively you're working. Um, I've heard you referred in the media as the dynamic duo. Um, one of my favorites because you're from opposing parties. You're from, you're a labor leader. The governor was a, a, a CEO. He's from a, a business side. They've referred to you as the odd couple. I mean, you're getting a lot of attention. First off, are you surprised at your relationship with the governor? And, and are you surprised at this media attention for two people getting along? No, I, I think in, in this world today, and those of you that don't understand, the governor's a Republican and I'm a Democrat. Uh, in, in the world of, of America today, I guess we're not supposed to talk and we're supposed to fight and we're supposed to degree, disagree on everything. Uh, but I spent 16 years in the legislature. Um, and, you know, in order to move our city forward, it's important to have a really strong relationship with the chief executive officer. Uh, in order to move the state forward, I think it's important to have a relationship with the capital city. Uh, and the governor and myself have, have teamed up, aligned in a lot of different ways, whether it's on transportation or economic development. And uh, our teams work really closely together. Uh, and we want, we want to continue to advance what we're trying to do here. Uh, we have something special in Massachusetts. Um, one, one, of the, one of the reasons General Electric, and they've made it perfectly clear, Jeff Emmelts came to Boston, uh, was the fact that he had a Republican governor, a Democratic mayor that actually liked each other and got along. Yep. Where when he was trying to go to other cities, they had people in the same party that weren't talking to each other. And uh, that is key. And bottom line, the governor's a good person. Yep. Uh, he has a big heart and he's a good man. And, and we have a great relationship. And, um, you know, um, we'll continue to have that relationship. It, it, was this the first time working with the governor? Or had you well, known him prior to? Uh, I knew who he was because he was a and F. I I wouldn't say I liked him back then because I didn't get all <laughs> what I wanted. Uh, but, but, but he ran the budget for the, for the state. Uh, but, you know, uh, th there's been a history here in Massachusetts, particularly in the legislature. Uh, it's a super majority Democratic legislature. But I, I would say that there's always been a very good relationship with a lot of people. Um, I view life as short, and I watch what's happening in Washington, D.C. Yep. in the last 10 years, and it's really literally crippled the country. Tough to watch. In a lot of ways, we don't have infrastructure money, we don't have education money, we don't have public safety money, we don't have a climate change issue, we don't have a lot of things. Yep. And, and by, by not having that relationship, if you can't get both sides to agree, they can't agree on anything. And you've you got to tell me there's something, there has to be some commonality where they can agree on. I think infrastructure might be one they could agree on. But what they're doing is, they're honestly, they're impacting us in so many different ways. So here in Boston, um, and the reason why I mentioned earlier is that we're 28% immigrants that live in our city. Uh, we are a city that's open to immigrants. We're a city that's open to people of color. We're a city that's open to, to, to moving forward. Uh, we have work to do, don't get me wrong, we're not perfect. I'd like to stand here and say I'm per we're perfect as a city. We're not, but it is about how do you move our city forward. And this relationship, this partnership that we have uh, is really important for, for the future of our city and our state. Jay, did you guys expect the relationship that you have with uh, Mayor Walsh? I personally did. I've known the mayor for quite some time. He was a state rep. I was a legislative aide and uh, knew uh, what he was about and uh, who he was, so I expected that. I, I have to say that I'm, I'm uh, impressed with 
the relationship that the mayor and the governor have. I'm a Democrat in a Republican administration, so uh, I thought for sure after a meeting or two that somebody would be giving me an orientation, you know, Republican 101. <laughs> I've spent a lifetime campaigning against Republicans, and yet uh, the governor asked me to be part of his administration. And uh, what I see in the governor and, and mayor, what I see in you all the time is that it's not about bad politics, it's about good public policy. And uh, the both of you have come together uh, supporting an agenda, which is about the people that you both represent. And uh, Brian, it really does then feed down to everybody else. And so uh, the relationship that our team has with the mayor's team um, allows us to really combine forces and do an amazing amount of things here in Boston. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, use you guys all the time when I do our uh, update for our board in New York City. And we, we're in New York, San Francisco, DC, and LA and I'll report about the absorption we have on leasing, the new companies coming to Boston, and then I'll report in on the relationship that uh, mayor you have with the state and each one of the other cities is like, what, the mayor and governor speak? I go, yeah, you ought to try it out. It's something you ought to encourage. <laughs> yeah, and uh, for the record, uh, Governor Baker is supposed to be sitting right here. Um, he is uh, getting ready for the big rivalry tonight. Uh, not the Yankees, Red Sox. It's the uh, Republican versus Democratic gubernatorial debate number one. Uh, so he will be there. Otherwise, he'd be sitting here, and maybe I'd be uh, standing over there. But uh, the fact of the matter is that um, there is something special happening here. And for those of you who haven't experienced it, know that if you could get to that place, the possibilities are endless. They really and are. All that time that you spend on the blocking and tackling involved in bad politics, instead put towards good public policy and the trust that you've established with the governor and, and back and forth shows, and you mentioned GE. Literally, GE said that the relationship between the mayor and the governor. Yeah, let's, the let's talk about GE. So GE was, uh, you had already had many uh, different wins together effectively, but GE really broke it wide open. And you've since actually taken some criticism, both at the state and the city. Maybe you can talk about that. But from the business community, I can attest that it just, everything changed. Everything changed. Every boardroom was talking about Boston talent. Do we need to be there? And the amount of tours just went through the roof for the people in uh, commercial office space here. And it hasn't stopped. As you guys look back, like what, what did you guys do differently, you think? You mentioned that you actually showed that you got along. But Mayor, I know you love sales pitches. I've seen you in action at the shopping center convention pitch in Boston. <laughs> what was the pitch? I think it was, we were all in the same room talking about it, about what, we, what Boston adds to, to a company like General Electric. Um, you know, obviously, when General Electric came to Boston, uh, you know, as they as they go through their, their their rise and I wouldn't say fall, there were ups and downs. The local press covers it literally every single every yep. single story. Um, we crafted a deal that actually was beneficial to GE, but it was also beneficial to the state and the city. That if they expand and grow here, uh, some of the incentives would, will kick in. Uh, we're able to talk to them about the workforce development. We're able to talk to them about the housing plan on the city side, the transportation plan on the, on the, on the, on the, on the state side, uh, really sell us and our values, who we are as, as, as a city. Um, you know, and Boston, Boston um, over the last five years, really has, I think, approached economic development in a different way. When you talk about having a plan, I think you, your city and state need to have a plan. And we, this, between the, the, the state and the state, I don't know how many active plans are out there, but the state's planning transportation, we're planning infrastructure in the city of Boston. Other cities are taking the model that we've done. Ha having, having an open dialogue, an honest open dialogue. And I think honestly, I, I mean, the, I don't think the governor sitting here would say it, it wasn't the governor and it wasn't myself. It was the people that work with us every single day. It was Jay, it was John Barros, it was Jay's team, it was John's team that were spending the time trying, trying to move this deal down the field. Um, I'm not sure who was in the final, but one city, I think that was in the final, not too far from me. I think they put a lot on the table, but ultimately it came down to, to Boston, Massachusetts because of what we have to offer as a city and, and, and the political climate. It's important. I think it's so important today to have a strong political climate that's a good climate. Uh, people are tired, and this is before, this is the pre-Trump era, if you will. Um, pe people, people are tired of that negativity, and, and, and they're sick of it. And if they see sure. something positive, they'll say, let's look at that place. Yeah, you know, for those who don't know, there's two administrations I can attest from the business side. You mentioned John Burroughs, your uh, economic uh, head. and. Um, when you talk to John, he has goals, something novel for government, and he'll talk to you about it. Here's what we're trying to achieve for the city. 
Um, it's remarkable, but the same thing's taking place on the state side, Jay. Um, let's jump to transportation and a segue from that um, so we get into some urban uh, stuff here. Transportation is, of course, incredibly important. All the bigger cities that, especially the ones that are having economic vitality right now, are all talking about transportation. You guys came in and you inherited quite a situation. A, a storm hits and suddenly we have an awareness by the administration that we've got a situation there. I think you knew it firsthand, but talk about we had train schedules on chalkboards and everything else. You had to bring a whole new knowledge world into um, Snowmageddon, it was Snowmageddon. Snowmageddon, yep. That was a, a tough awakening, but uh, transportation is incredibly important. You've made a position with the governor that it's about, look, let's get the trains working first and on time, and then we can talk about growth. The, the flip side, Mayor, um, that you could comment on next is, for you, you've talked about transportation as that equalizer for job opportunities. So you want to get transportation to as many people as possible. Your lieutenant governor wants to get transportation up to the Lowell's, Lawrence's, and uh, New Bedford's. Oh. Talk a little bit about transportation and what you guys are working on there. Yeah, as you all know, uh, transportation is part of the, the three-legged stool of the economy with housing and workforce being the other two. When GE came here, the mayor's right, we didn't put the most incentives on the table, but what we had to offer was talent. Uh, Massachusetts and specifically Greater Boston has the uh, highest level of, of talent in the, uh, in the country. And so when GE was looking at where it needed to be in order to be able to take advantage of all the opportunities that exist in the 21st century, they couldn't imagine being anywhere else but Boston. Uh, if I was the governor, the governor would be telling his joke right now. The governor's joke is the, the secret to the Massachusetts success story is you help to establish two great institutions, and he was talking about Harvard and MIT, and then you wait 200 years. <laughs> uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, those two institutions in BC and Northeastern and BU and so many others have come together and are just producing uh, so many uh, smart people, uh, as we say, wicked smart people. Um, our, uh, translations are available, by the way, in the back if you need earphones. Um, so um, the talent is number one. Transportation is obviously um, uh, an important issue for all of us. Uh, the great news here in Massachusetts, we have more people working today than ever before. More people working today than ever before. Guess what that causes? Causes traffic, causes jams at our uh, public transportation spaces. And the governor, the mayor, other mayors around the uh, state uh, recognize that and are working collaboratively to deal with that. Uh, Brian, you're right. Uh, part of the strategy is to fix what you have. Uh, we have um, we have cars on our uh, subway system that were operating on the big storm of 1978. Do you remember where you were in 1978? Yeah. I was in high school. There were red line cars too in my line. Yeah, exactly. So we still have those cars in operation. So That's part so of the strategy, incredible to believe. It's yeah, just wild. It really. Um, so part of it is uh, fix what you have, but you know we've also found uh, money for expansion, and so uh, we have subway expansion, the Green Line expansion that's uh, running from Boston into uh, Cambridge and Somerville, and uh, we're creating a new commuter rail uh, system down the, to New Bedford. So the ideas that we saw was you have to fix what's broken. You can't build. Uh, think about your own houses. Uh, you can't make improvements onto a bad foundation. And so we needed to fix that foundation, but uh, we've also found ways to grow. Um, in my neighboring Chelsea, I grew up uh, next to Boston. Uh, my community of Chelsea used to be a neighborhood of Boston. Uh, there was just a uh, bus rapid transit expansion, the Silver Line, um, into Chelsea. In Chelsea, you can arrive at both South Station and North Station from the same location in Chelsea. It's really remarkable. So, Brian, we know that transportation needs to be fixed. Oftentimes, growth doesn't happen where the train stations are. Right, so Seaport District is a, a great example of this, where uh, there's been a tremendous amount of growth under Mayor Walsh and the, um, uh, the BPDA, and uh, with the help of the development community and with so many end users, uh, we need to now meet that growth with better transportation options. And so it's great to have a partner on the local level like Mayor Walsh and his team um, so that we're not arguing about whose responsibility it is. Instead, we agree that it's our joint responsibility to first plan and then work that plan, and we're doing that right now. Yeah, so for those in the room, I'm originally from Texas. With the neighborhoods that um, Jay talked about, they didn't grow up in Boston, but in another city, it would be Boston because the geographic oh, sure. limits of cities are much different than the city of Boston. Um, so the cooperation level has to be at, at different levels to, to make that happen. One of the things, Mayor, that I think has been so great, you've had a lot of prosperity in Boston, but you've, you, you haven't done it where you're trying to compete with Cambridge and with uh, Somerville, et cetera. You've said that if, if Boston goes up, all boats will rise. 
Yeah, we're taking a regional approach here in Boston. And um, before I became the mayor, uh, Vertec Pharmaceutical, which is across the street, came to Boston, and it was a great win for the city. Huge and, win. And they left, Huge. Came, they left Cambridge, the city next door, and they came here. Uh, and then Partners Healthcare, which was in Boston, left here and went to Somerville. Um, and and those, that was a nice win for Somerville and a great win for Boston. And, uh, but, but that doesn't grow your economy. But by, by going after companies or, or taking companies from one, if they come here, they come here. I'm not going to say I don't want you to move to our city. But it really is about how do you build, how do you build up all the economies and how do you build up that infrastructure. And one of the first things I did as mayor is I sat down with the, the mayor of Braintree and, and Quincy and Chelsea, a city manager, and Somerville, and we created what's called the Red Line Corridor. Um, because it's connected to Cambridge and it's connected to Braintree and there's an opportunity whether it's housing or economic development, life sciences and creating th those corridors and um, you know we've been successful to some degree um, as, far as, as far as planning out those areas but, but ultimately what all this comes down to in my opinion is planning, putting good planning, whether yep. it's transportation. It's just like anyone in this room. When, you, when you're building a building, you're thinking about all of the things that we talked about in, in, when I gave the little speech here today. You think about resiliency, you think about, you think about uh, green buildings, you think about uh, amenities for you, the people in the building, you think about where it's located. And, and as I think about, as the, as the city, when we think about planning, that Imagine Boston 2030 plan wasn't a plan that we created and put on the shelf. It's a living, breathing document that will evolve and change over time. So whether it's transportation connections, whether it's environmental protections, whether it's arts and culture protections, all the different aspects of the plan, it's there to change and evolve and really have a guide to move our city forward. Um, this, this waterfront has been, was under, um, the idea of planning this out was about 25 years. Um, and it really was the Mokley, uh, actually the Cromwell Pier, which is right across, was the first thing here, uh, the World Trade, the, the um, the hotel, across the Seaport Hotel, and then the Mowgli Courthouse came, and then they started putting in buildings. And, and what we're really looking at is planning the process. And, and part of that, there's a bridge on this wall here to, the, to your left, lower left, the North, uh, Northern Air Bridge. That's closed right now, and it's in the open position. And as we were building out the waterfront, we built the Mowgli Bridge, but no one, no one ever took time to think about that bridge. And that's a major entry and exit point and a connection to the South Boston waterfront with the Rose County Greenway. And we're in the process right now of designing a new bridge there and thinking about what's gonna be on that bridge. But the point is we have to be planning forward because it, it opens up so many more opportunities and so many other possibilities. Uh, we're planning out the, the industrial side of the park right now. As you notice, when you walk out the front door to the right, there's not a lot going on down there. There's actually a lot going on down there, but there's another f almost 40% of land mass of the sub Boston waterfront that's undeveloped right now. So we could be plotting buildings left and right down there, but we, we're looking at a plan and how do we do something better? That's really about, I think, the future. Yeah, I, Ryan, I, I gotta, I, I'm just gonna, the mayor is selling himself short on his leadership in the region. There was something that happened last week that I took particular notice of, and I want all of you to think about your hometowns and, and the mayors who lead your hometown. Last week in Massachusetts, in Greater Boston, 15 communities came together and signed a historic compact attacking the affordable housing crisis that we have here in Greater Boston. 15 communities came together signing a compact to create 135,000 new housing units by 2030 in Greater Boston area. The mayor not only brought those people together, not only helped to form that compact, but this mayor, the mayor of the capital city, allowed for the ceremony for this historic compact to be in one of the neighboring communities. Mayor, I, I don't know many mayors of big cities that would have put their own self aside, their own ego aside, to allow for other communities to experience part of what Boston has. And the fact of the matter is, I, I grew up in neighboring Chelsea. Boston's got 600,000 residents, Chelsea's got 40. And a uh, mayor called me in when I was city manager and said, let's work on uh, life sciences together. It's, it's really remarkable, and if you want to think about why this region is working so well. It happens because of leadership, leadership like uh, this mayor is showing, and it allows for everything else to be possible. We're all working together, and we're working together because the people at the top invite us in and share the riches. Yeah, you know, one of the, the, the paradoxes of what's taking place, you get cities like San Francisco, Seattle, and, and um, Boston through your focus, Mayor, and, and uh, Jay through the state on affordable housing. You got all this prosperity, but on the other side, we don't have affordable housing. It's a tough situation. For We've got a lot of developers in the room. Any suggestions that uh, you've got right now for how we can get more affordable housing? I know build, Mayor, baby, build. Goals. Build, baby, build is the message. Uh, so... Uh, 
Uh, again, mayor has set a goal for Boston, and with those 14 other uh, leaders set a goal for Greater Boston. Uh, the governor set a goal of 125,000 units by 2025. They overlap a little bit. We have, of course, a larger uh, geographical jurisdiction to worry about, but uh, we're marshalling our resources in. Uh, together, the mayor and the governor have been able to tap into state resources with the city providing uh, money as well. We've done 3,800 units together in, in four years. Uh, the, the state has dedicated almost $200 million in tax credits and affordable housing uh, funds to um, support the mayor's agenda. And the reason why we support that is because we see him ponying up and putting up dollars. Frankly, Orient Heights in East Boston would be an example where we're spending a lot of money to rehab a, a state public housing unit, and the mayor is showing up with linkage funds derived from downtown Boston. Uh, with uh, CPA funds, Community Preservation Act funds, where Boston is self-taxing itself to raise more money to support affordable housing. So we're in it together, uh, Mayor and the Governor, um, the staffs are in it together. Our funds are almost fungible, it's state money or city money working together to create more affordable housing and we need every bit of it and more. And, and what makes Boston work is, is our diversity. I, I've said it a couple of times, I'm gonna continue to say it. Um, it's so important on the diversity of our city to keep our city diverse. Uh, and to keep our city diverse means creating opportunities for housing to battle income inequality. It's about creating more housing. Um, the jobs are here, creating more opportunities for employment. It, it truly does work. And, and it's something that, that I believe in, in, in my soul that we have to continue to move forward and push on. And you know, we're gonna continue to push affordable housing. We've taken our, our land lots that we've had around the city of Boston. I think we've built 800 single and, and duplex family, two family homes in the city. We're looking at that. We're looking at how do we create more transit oriented development. How do, we, how do we make sure the inclusionary development policy that was 13% affordable, we raised it to 18% by sitting down with the developers like you, Brian, who put people in the room, understanding that it doesn't break the deal, but it allows the opportunity to create more housing. Yep. So it's those funds partnering with the state. Uh, they passed the historic housing bond bill, $1.8 billion this year. Um, we got to continue to, to work on those partners. And, and in lieu of not having a strong federal partner, and I, I'm really disappointed because we don't have a federal partner, um, you know, that's what the federal government should be doing, uh, housing and infrastructure. But the fact that we don't have them as a partner, we have to think of creative ways. And honestly, sometimes it comes down to many of you in this room, uh, developers and real estate folks that have to take part in, in this process of moving us forward. Let's talk about another area that you took a stand on. You took a stand on immigration, Mayor, but you also took a stand on sustainability. And I can't help but reflect when you were a candidate for mayor, um, you came to the Green Ribbon Council which is um, Boston has a council that was put together by Amos Hostetter. It's been a, a remarkable council of every business, every university, or big businesses, small businesses, this whole diversified group talking about a, a plan uh, that we could recommend to leadership on sustainability and climate resiliency. You came to that council, and I'll never forget it. You said, look, I don't know much about sustainability, but I want to learn. Well, you've become a quick study jumping forward a few years to making the stand you made with, with the federal government when they decided to get out of the climate action. Yeah, you have to. I mean, when you think about Boston, we had the hottest winter on record this year. In 2015, we had 1 .6, uh, 106 inches of snow um, in the city of Boston. We set a record. Um, we have, you know, t tomorrow's going to be 80. Last night was 50. So there's something going on here. Uh, we've had floods in our city. We ha like I said, we haven't seen what New York has experienced or used in Puerto Rico, but that's not that far away from us here or in the Carolinas a couple weeks ago. So we are thinking about, and we're building you know, billions of dollars worth of development, nine billion going on right now this year alone. So we are thinking about how do we protect our, 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 our properties in the city? How do we protect our residents in the city? Um, you know, making that upfront investment in sustainability today will save us billions and billions and billions of dollars of disaster relief money coming to the city. And I would rather make the investment on the front end rather than have to go to FEMA and get it on the back end. And it's so, so important for us. You know, we're gonna be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, in, in a week, I'm, 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 I have a speech to talk about sustainability and about the future of our waterfront. And, and our waterfront's not just here in downtown. Our waterfront's in our neighborhoods. Uh, right now in Boston, at the Four Point Channel, which is to the left, of, to the left of this building, and 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 the Atlantic Ocean, um, if we had a superstorm, they'd connect at Moakley Park in South Boston, yep. and what they, they'd flood out tens of thousands of homes Vulnerable and spot. neighborhoods and businesses, and that's not downtown. That's in the crowd of our neighborhood. So we're looking at ways of how do we create opportunities. And again, it's a plan. Um, that plan will have to be paid for by 
the state investment, city investment, federal government investment, eventually um, some philanthropic investment, as well as, as the development investments. Yeah, I'd encourage for the urban planners in the room to really take a look at, um, at the plan that the city has. Um, you took a, a, um, time on it. You brought people to the table, all the neighborhoods. But it's really paid off because now everybody's in. And it also sets expectation. Developers love to know predictability about what a political leader or administration's thinking, and you've set that out there, which is just so helpful. Um, well, we got a closing minute here. So right now, it seems as though you're getting a lot of attention because of this bipartisan relationship that may be the only one in the United States that's working right now um, and certainly getting the most attention. For you two, any suggestions for our audience here for their, as they go back to their states and, for that matter, countries? I, I go by a 90-10 rule. So I'm a Democrat in a Republican administration. I've learned a lot in this last four years being in a Republican administration. And I've created this 90-10 rule where I believe that 10 percent of us, we're never going to convince. The other 90 percent, we can get to work together. And with that 90 percent, 90 percent of us believe 90 percent of the same things. We always seem to fight about the last 10 percent. And Good what we've point, been able Jay. to do here in Massachusetts is to focus on that 90 percent. And so leadership on both the uh, state and local level make that possible. I, I, I agree with that. And I also agree with to, to, to agree on a common set of goals and move forward towards those goals and, and try and stay, stay in your areas in that area. If you can go beyond it, you can. Uh, you know, they joke about the governor and myself. I mean, we don't agree on everything. Uh, but we agree on enough to move, move, move things forward, and we agree on more than we disagree on, I'll put it that way, a lot more than we disagree with. Uh, but but it, is, it is about moving, moving the, advancing the city, the state, the town, wherever you live, forward, and how do you do that the best way? Um, you know, you think about what's, what's happened in Boston in the last five years, um, you know, 100,000 new jobs, 50,000 new people. It's wild. The number. Development like we've never had before. Uh, companies moving in like that's never happened before. And that relationship is key to that. And it's important to have a good partner, not just the two people at the top, but, you know, my transportation person lines up with the Secretary of Transportation of the state side, John and Jay. And you go right down the list, DCR and Parks. It, it's all these same synergies. Um, you know, we're not that big of a state. Um, right. But Boston, right. Boston, you know, we generate 20% of the, the revenue in the, in the state here in Boston. But what happens in Boston affects the rest of the state. What happens in the rest of the state affects Boston. So it's important for us to continue to work together. So I would encourage you to get people in the room and say, you know, put aside your differences and focus on what's important. I got elected. I'm a Democrat. I didn't get elected as a Democrat. I'm not the, I'm not the Democratic representative of the mayor of Boston. I'm the mayor of Boston. I represent all of the people that live in my city, whether they're Democrats, independents, unenrolled, Green Party, or what have you. They might not agree with me on my social platform on issues, but it is about moving the city forward. Well, Mayor, I can speak for the business community. Long live the dynamic duo, and thank you so much for your leadership, Mayor and Jay. Thank, thank you. Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.